Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. So the plan was to try and do the, our episode on slavery, particularly the Old Testament, and well, that's still in the works, but Billy's had a bunch of work stuff going on. I've been traveling for work, uh, and it just, I got very little progress done on that, so <laughs> we right. had to postpone that. What we did manage to do was listen to a debate that happened recently, last uh, five, six days or so, and uh, we wanted to talk about that, and we wanted to talk about what it means to know anything. Like, what, what does the Bible say about us uh, n- knowing anything in kind of a, an epistemological sense, but also, um, I don't know, we're going to explore a lot of it, and... There's no telling what direction this episode actually ends up going right. by the time we're done. <laughs> right. But uh, that's what that's what we're setting out to do, and, and kind of to address skepticism in its uh, different forms as well. So, yeah, yeah I, uh, I was traveling Monday and Tuesday, lots of hours. So, we both had a chance to listen to a lot of different stuff, and uh, that led to this. For the so, where we're going to start with this is just uh, six days ago on the eleventh. Um, there was a posting slash debate uh, regarding Mike Winger and Matt Dillahunty. Um, for those of you who have been watching us, we know that um, Braxton Hunter debated Matt Dillahunty. Has it been two months now or so? Um, um, it's been a while. Basically, does was it does the Christian God exist? I think it was. Um, mm-hmm. This specific specific debate um, was on capturing Christianity, which is a a program where the host likes to get two people on to discuss things basically um from what i've gathered um i i've not heard of him prior to this it just happened to show up on my feed probably because i've listened to matt dillahunty's videos in the past and now it, you know youtube shows me what I've, well i might be interested in but anyway um yep. appeared on four uh, april 11th and their debate was on is belief in the resurrection unreasonable and just the the video that i just i just went and looked at it just before we started that video already has 3,400 comments and counties <laughs> in six days. Oh, uh, I I actually jumped into some of the comments in Braxton's video and his debate with Matt Dillahunty, uh-huh. and just people making absurd claims that I couldn't take seriously, and I just I, I had to stop. I can't, right, <laughs> like, and and we'll talk about suppressing the truth later. But it, like, some people claimed that there is zero evidence, and and nobody believes that. Jesus actually existed historically to which I said, that's crazy. And, and like, uh, I'm not going to engage with right. that person because they're out of their mind. But, right. um, yeah. So 3,400 comments. I don't even want to know what's going on in those. Yeah. That's, that's a complete waste of time. Um, it's like, uh, yeah. Cool. What's interesting is, you know, the, the question is, is belief in the resurrection unreasonable? That's actually, if you recall, Matt, that was something that we, when Braxton initially said that um, Leighton had asked him to debate Matt Dillahunty, and he, they were talking about the debate topic, we kept leaning Braxton towards, you know, is belief in the Christian God reasonable? Because yeah. of the videos that we've seen on Matt Dillahunty and how his um, position or tactic is always basically skepticism right and Mm -hmm. it would it's easier to um prove or argue for you know reasonableness in something is 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 it reasonable to to believe that the chair you're going to sit on is going to hold you up kind of thing yeah it it, well and what i like about it now i'm gonna save that for the end but uh, yeah i i thought that would have been a the way it's worded is easier to defend mm-hmm. from a Christian perspective. Um, but yeah, I want to save that comment for the end. What did you think of the, the debate? So it is, is belief in the resurrection unreasonable or reasonable or however it's worded. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you think of Mike? How did Mike Winger do? How did Matt Dillahunty do? Do we see anything new out of Matt that we haven't seen in the past? So just to get a, a little recap, a uh, real review summary of what happened basically you know they did their 20 minute arguments just like braxton did with matt dillahunty and and basically mike winger gave uh, 12 what he called evidences um for um belief in the resurrection and that is reasonable and um 
they, they were all non-supernatural events, right? And they were basically um, based upon uh, testimony and uh, basically testimony, personal testimony um, uh, from, you know, whether that be biblical testimony from various authors, historical testimonies from, you know, historians, etc. cetera. Um, and what we saw, and he went through all 12 of them or 12 of them. And then what we saw from Matt Dillahunty was again, very much similar to what he did with Braxton, where he basically said, well, I don't count those as evidences. And really in, in this one, he says those, none of those are evidences. Those are claims. Um, but basically he pointed to them being not evidences that are justifiable or what he would count as justifiable. Yeah. I, I liked uh, Mike's approach because he it, and if you don't know who Mike Winger is, go to YouTube. Just type in Mike Winger. He's got a big page, thirty something thousand follow mm. or subscribers, or yeah, you'll find him. Um, and, and he does a lot of apologetic stuff. But one thing I liked about his approach was he wasn't arguing for the reliability of the Gospels, but he was coming at it more from a historian's perspective and and giving inform giving evidence and it was evidence, not claims, uh, giving evidence from that even a secular historian would agree with. And saying all of this points to uh, the reasonableness of believing that there was a resurrection. And um, overall, I thought just his opening case was really good. Matt Dillahunty, yeah, like you said, he he is the the skeptic. I mean, like that he, -uh. he wears that badge proudly. Yeah, exactly. He anything that you say, he's gonna ask questions about. And I'm not saying all skepticism is wrong because to an extent, we're skeptics, right? When we look at our tradition and we go. I don't know if that's right. Let's find out what the Bible says. You know, let's let's poke holes in it and see if it's wrong. We are an ex we are being skeptical of our previously established beliefs, and that's fine. But in in this is not just me saying this, but skepticism can be taken way too far to where it it leaves you with the inability to actually land on any conclusion mm -hmm. or to believe anything. Right. And I think that's really where Matt has gone is he's, he's to this ultra skeptical position where uh, even the kind of inductive argument that that Mike brought, where you take all this information and you say, OK, one reasonable explanation for all of this is Jesus did come back from the dead. He, he can't even admit that he can't see it. Right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I uh, when I was thinking about this earlier. I was thinking about you know people changing their beliefs and worldviews and such, and we see basically with any kind of beliefs there is a um, a worldview that is behind it. And I, I yesterday I actually listened to William uh, Dr. Craig William Lane Craig on um, epistemology, and it was from eight years ago, and he talked about the the differences. Um, and, and the rapid increase in, in philosophy, especially religious philosophy, just in the past 20 years. But he mentioned something um, about what oh, – no, it wasn't, it wasn't him. It was somebody else. What causes or persuades someone to change their worldview? Not right. There's lots of things that you know we change our opinion on, but they don't affect our worldview. But when, when we start to – get into the realm where we're changing a worldview, which changing religions would be a worldview. Um, going from non-religion to religion would be a worldview. Um, those, those requ Republican to Democrat. Yeah. It doesn't have to be religious. Yeah. Right. Right. Those <laughs> yeah. are worldview positions. Um, and it made me think of you, Matt, because you had basically what would be a worldview shift from a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From, I mean, it, it, it's not as drastic as like non-religion to religion, but it was definitely drastic in the sense of, um, it, it completely changed your thought process of the Bible, of some foundational beliefs, um, with when you went from Calvinism to basically non-Calvinism. Or, I mean, I could just say Calvinism to the truth. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, one of the episodes, or one of the podcasts that I like, granted, he is secular. He doesn't, I mean, he, he's some of it leaks out every now and then in like pretty, pretty strong ways, but, uh, it's, you are not so smart. It's the name of the podcast. You are not so smart. And he has several episodes about what it takes to change someone's mind. And it's not generally uh, showing them all this evidence. That's not what ends up changing someone's mind. And, and uh, there's a bunch of stuff like that. I mean, he, he goes over confirmation bias. He goes over um, uh, a, a whole bunch of related topics talking to 
neurologists and psychologists and psychiatrists mm-hmm. and, and and examining what is it that causes someone to believe this way versus that way. Very interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, we've all experienced when we watch like a, a mystery or a thriller, you know, where the director and, and such, we, we have all of these evidences that are evidences that are presented before us. And we come to this conclusion of like, oh, it's definitely so-and-so. And then there's that twist, which makes us completely and totally reevaluate the evidence and how we interpreted the evidence. And it's something mm-hmm. completely different, right? It's like a completely a paradigm shift of how we interpret the evidence. The evidence didn't change. It's just how we interpreted it and how we saw it and what we chose to believe in regards to the evidence changed. It's a classic duck versus rabbit. Yes, exactly. <laughs> if you don't know what we're talking about, Google the picture, duck, duck, rabbit. Mm-hmm. And you'll see when you look at it at first, you'll see one or the other. But then if you know that there's another option, you can kind of switch back and forth in your mind. But which one you you choose to call it, you know, at first could be different. Right. You could disagree with someone. Um, so, yeah, the debate was interesting. Uh, it, it was pretty much what I would expect out of a debate like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought Mike did great. There was a, a spot where I think he was defending against something Matt wasn't saying. And for like five minutes, it kind of devolved into them arguing back and forth. Yeah. Uh, but if you kind of overlook that, I thought Mike, Mike did really well. The one thing I wished <clears throat> at the end that he had made really clear was it. when we say something is reasonable, we, um, essentially what we're saying is uh, given all of the evidence, we could see how that is a possible conclusion. Right. And what Matt Dillahunty would have to do to prove that the resurrection of Christ is unreasonable is to provide a solid argument. Uh, yeah, it had to be solid, logical argument for why it, um, right. there is no possible way that the resurrection could have taken place. Right. and that's He did not do that. Not at all, no. Um, yeah, I looked up, right before we started, I looked up, you know, based upon the, the, is the belief in the resurrection unreasonable? Unreasonable is not governed by or acting according to reason, right? Synonyms would be like baseless, foundationless, groundless, invalid, non-valid, unfounded, unsubstantiated, unsupported, unwarranted, right? That's unreasonable. Um, And and you could look at, well, Matt, uh, Mike has, none of those things would apply, right? He has reasons. He has, um, you know, uh, valid reasons. Um, It's not groundless on on his view. And again, he he just did a small picture of like, just looking at, these things right and he could have expanded the scope you know looking at you know logic and rationality and uh you know the God, all, all sorts of different things um but then you look at so that's unreasonable if you look at the like the legal definition of um not reasonable beyond what can be can be accepted um let's see clearly inappropriate uh, lacking justification in fact or circumstance an unreasonable inference so that's oh. kind of where Matt was going. He's trying to say he basically said, "Well, what you you, you were presenting as evidence, they're just claims, they're not evidence, and the, I don't see those being. Um, I don't see where you can infer those claims as evidence for reasonable justification of the resurrection." Yeah, a definition of evidence being the available body of facts or information indicating whether belief or proposition is true or valid. Right. And so when you're looking at a historical event, what you're going to do is is uh, look for what's called, um, well, in, in writing, it's what's called verisimilitudes. So if we're looking for vera, meaning true, similitudes, meaning similars, similarities. Um, so if we were to look at the Gospels and their account of the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, and we were to see mention of... Um, I don't know, uh, a, a pocket watch. <laughs> that is that is not fit with the the time period that that happened at all. And we would say, okay, there's a serious problem going on with this account. It doesn't. There are not the appropriate things that we would expect to see for that time period. Right. So what Mike did was he went through and said, all right, um, when we talk about this guy Joseph of Arimathea, for instance, was Arimathea a place around here where? This guy Joseph would have been from. Right. Uh, yeah, in fact, it was nearby. Was uh, 
did he could he have possibly owned the type of grave or cave uh, you know tomb that they put Jesus in yeah in fact that's one of the three types of tombs that were in that area was Joseph of Arimathea rich enough to actually own one of those tombs well he was part of the Sanhedrin and the Sanhedrin were the ones who generally owned that kind of tomb okay all these verisimilitudes all these th- these these things these little details in the gospel are saying uh, are fitting with all the other historical evidence we have about that time period. So we're building up a reliable case that we can trust what was in those gospels. And um, that is all part of the available body of facts. That is in fact evidence that the account of the gospel is true. Now, if you go in and you find um, and uh, like, I don't know, some, something that is blatantly scientifically wrong or obviously does not fit that time period then you have a problem and you look at the Quran or the book right. of Mormon is a great example of that. And I, and I think that's kind of where Matt Dillahunty was going with the whole justification thing. Um, there's like three things that I want to talk about. Um, basically his, his claim, like, well, based upon these claims, right. You can't then leap to resurrection because there's no evidence that resurrections are possible, that kind of thing. Um, but, when you think about what what Mike did, you know, he talked about the personal testimony on Christ's death, the personal testimony that people lost hope and that, you know, if they lost hope, right, because the what they who they thought was the Messiah died and then there was a resurgence of that and it actually became stronger and stronger, that's that's evidence, right? There's personal testimony that he was entombed, there's personal uh, there's a personal testimony that the tomb was empty. There's personal testimony of his appearances after after his uh resurrection. You know, there's this is personal testimony of the sincerity of the disciples that they lived their life and then they like died for him in that belief. You know, there's early testimony of Jesus's existence and and uh, the resurrection and that the disciples said that they saw him. You know, all there's personal testimony of James, you know, uh, of Paul, all these things. So those are the those are all the like the the what he said the evidence is presented. So Matt are personal testimonies evidence? Yes, absolutely. Do you remember what Matt Dillahunty called them? Uh, and anecdotes, anecdotal evidence, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, in a sense, it is. If I tell you that I have experienced uh, flying, right, and you have no way of verifying that truth. Now, let's say I I could actually fly. Just mm-hmm. this, in this hypothetical world, I can fly. And I tell Billy, I can fly. And he says, prove it. Well, I don't have to prove it. I can say, no, I'm not going to prove it. Does that invalidate the fact that I can fly? Right. No, it just means Billy's not going to believe it. Right. So, so it, you, you could say that all of these eyewitness testimonies, uh, I choose not to believe those things, which comes to, we're going to get to the whole choosing what to believe and not. Um I choose not to believe those accounts because they're just stories from those people. You, you could choose to believe that, but you could still also be choosing not to believe what is reality, what is fact, and that is Jesus did come back from the grave, and these people did witness it, and they did testify about it. You're just refusing to accept those testimonies. Right. So testimony can be true. Right. Um, yeah, I think that was one of the biggest th- claims that I want to talk about just for a minute here, is does our society, did the biblical society um history court systems do we count personal testimony as evidence carefully (laughs) i mean yes and no i mean if i'm on a jury and i hear someone say that they saw the murderer or the person who who shot the other guy um i'm gonna want to know you know what time of day it was how far away were you Uh, all this stuff so I can decide just how helpful that personal testimony is. Mm -hmm. So I guess with a grain of salt, you could. uh, Historically, have people relied on personal testimony? Yeah. Even scripture says uh, on the basis of two or three witnesses. Right. That's how they were to judge in the court system. Mm -hmm. Our court system, actually, the majority of cases fall upon the testimony, the personal testimony of witnesses. You call a witness to the stand. They allege to the truth. They they, they uh, there's like three factors they have to have. They have to, uh, observe the facts. They have to um, swear to tell the truth. Uh, basically, things like that. And then their their testimony is counted as evidence for or against you know the crime. Um, and that's the majority of how the court system works. There's also a, you know other evidence that they bring in, physical evidence, etc. But a majority of it is like there was an eyewitness that saw you shoot that dude over there. You know that's like. 
the smoking gun, so to speak. <laughs> right? That's how it's been throughout history. Um, and we could, see that. Could a person lie? Absolutely. Right. right. And, so and, we're not saying that all personal testimony right. is true. About right. We're not saying that just because it's personal testimony that is true, but we're saying that it's been, and it still is today, a justifiable um, piece of evidence when you look at a big picture. It is counted as part of that whole, like, you know, is it, um, did they, they, did they commit murder, right? You know, how, what's the, how's the court system say, um, on whether or not guilty, um, uh, no, beyond, beyond reasonable, a reasonable doubt. doubt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's that, that whole reason, right. So, right. And, and part of the evidence that's presented that they count as reasonable is personal testimony. Go through your other two before I, I jump to something else because uh, you said you had three things. Oh, um, so I don't remember what the other two were now. So yeah, we have um, You're so old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we have basically <laughs> personal testimony that that and, and claims, and you know Matt kept saying that you know, test it's a claim. Well, a claim uh, can be evidence, and it's shown to be evidence. So I think that's kind of a false um, idea. It, it it is true that is a claim, and it, if you can. But we we can still take personal testimony as truth, um, as a fact, as evidence. Um, we don't hold it as high as other evidences, but it is still an evidence nonetheless. And, and that's kind of where I was going with, like, it's anecdotal evidence. It's still evidence. It's just in a different category, right? Um, but again, it's... In, even in my job, we take sworn statements. We take affidavits, right? Those are th- things that you can put into co- the court system and they count as legal evidence. And so uh, it's funny as you're talking, I'm thinking about, <laughs> I hate to base this on TV, but I'm thinking about all the, the court cases you've seen on TV where um, someone will have a witness come up to testify against another witness and, you know, objection. And, and the, the lawyer says, well, no, it goes to character. Mm-hmm. Um, you can have an eyewitness and uh, it turns out that person's a scumbag and you can discredit it. And so it, it, when we're looking at the gospels and in the accounts that are about Jesus' resurrection, we want to look at all the other stuff around it because just by itself, like you said, it, it is a claim. Jesus was raised from the dead. Let's look at everything else that that, got, that person said and, and not just the gospel, but that said about him to understand, is this account uh, worth even valuing? Right. Do we find out that this person's actually a liar? Does it go to, if, it, if it's against his character, we may decide just to not accept that into evidence. However, if we find that consistently it, it, they are telling the truth we find these verisimilitudes we we see that what they are saying comports with reality at that time and we it gives us reason to it to at least consider the possibility that they're telling the truth about the resurrection which means it isn't unreasonable to go to that to, to land on that conclusion right and again that's where i think matt failed was he did not prove it was impossible there's no possible world where the resurrection happened uh, and on that basis alone, Mike, Mike Winger wins the debate because the question was, is it unreasonable? No, based on all this evidence, that could have been the, the what happened. Right. Yeah. Um, in law and in um, pretty much life, um, when somebody makes a claim, you know, that is, is evidence, right? Your the, the defense's goal is to discredit the witness. And that's basically what Mike, Mike Wing was trying to say is like, where's your way of discrediting these facts of information that these claims, these evidences mm-hmm. that these people made, like the personal testimony when, when Thomas, you know, he actually had doubt. He was a skeptic, right, of Jesus and his resurrection. And then he had evidence presented for him, which was Jesus himself. And he saw the hands and, right, and his opinion changed. Right? Where's your evidence to discredit the witness that we have? Yeah, so that that takes us to uh, the Bible, which is you know Bible bro down. That's <laughs> that's where we like to play. And um, what we've the last two episodes that we've had, we explained what the gospel is. It's the, king, the establishment of a kingdom and the declaration of how you are uh, a admitted into that kingdom that you trust the Lord that you are faithful. Um, and then we last week we talked about the universal witness, the fact that God has told everybody enough that they can know him, that they can trust him, that they can honor him, give him thanks and be credited with righteousness and be entered into the kingdom that he has in fact told everybody essentially what the gospel is. Mm -hmm. 
call on his name for salvation. That that's what it takes. Um, and what you're saying is that any, any witness, any testimony, any revelation really comes down to the character of the person giving it. Are they trustworthy or are they not? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and, and I'll let you take us into kind of choosing to believe in evidence versus, uh, you know, what we've talked about, but, um, I, I just want to put it in people's heads to start thinking about the fact that when we're looking at what did God give us, what kind of revelation do we get from him? We have to look at his character and see, is he worth believing or not? Which we would obviously say, of course he is. Um, and then versus what are the arguments against it and what essentially, um, do we trust God and his testimony or do we trust the world or at least my own mind and the, the, the testimony that I'm giving myself, which one do I choose God mm-hmm. or me? Right. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting. You know, when I mentioned, you know, you try to discredit the witness and that's kind of what you, you're saying is that we can discredit people and it, it really, it, falls back to can we discredit God and he and over and over and over and over again in scripture you know God says he does things you know to make his name known to for his own credit like he he makes the proclamation and it comes to pass and that's to show his trustworthiness you know he's like I'm not a man that I should lie that those kind of things you see lots of things like that in scripture on God basically saying try to discredit me right <laughs> and 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 then look at all the evidences that i've given you you know that that show that you should not that that you cannot discredit me um so i think it's interesting that you bring that up because i mean it really does it falls back on to who are you putting your trust in are you putting your trust on um these people over here and this information that they're providing or the their the, the claims that they're making or the claim that this person over here is making or the claim that god is making who you're putting trust in. And all of that is based upon choice. It's it, we, we, we often try to think that evidence is, um, well, if I had enough evidence, I would believe it. And that that's not necessary. That's for one, we can just look at ourselves. We can look at examples that we have with people in our lives. We can look at history and we can see that evidence itself is not causal. Right. You know, we definitely see we can see a correlation between evidences and beliefs, but we don't we can't see that evidences are causal. That just because you have X evidence, it causes you to believe. That's a well fault. because yeah, and, and nobody cares. Oh, well, I'm not saying nobody. People care about what evidence is, but it, when it comes to changing beliefs or not, it's how you interpret that evidence. You can have you can have. Uh, I mean, we, we, we do around us. Um, let's take the, 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 the grand old flat earth debate, right? Um, I do not believe in flat earth. Stop spreading that lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not you, but you listeners, you know who you are. Dad, stop it. Uh, Bridget. <laughs> Bridget. Uh, anyway, um, what we have is in the world around us is, is a whole bunch of evidence for how the world works for, um, it, it, well, in it, what we have with the flat earth versus the round earth is a group of people deciding to look at that evidence and draw certain conclusions, um, based on how they're choosing to interpret it. And then you have the other side who is looking at the evidence, interpreting it a different way and then drawing conclusions based on that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all it, through it, inductive really, reasoning, right? It, well, that and choice. Right. They're choosing to interpret one way or the other, even mm-hmm. though all the facts are the same. The the Earth is here. The you know gravity happens. How how does that happen? Well, we can interpret that different ways. You know? Right. It's it's really comes down to choice. What are you choosing to? Right, to, and it, you know, it, and we can see how how much choice plays a part in that. With you know, one of the 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 errors with like inductive reasoning or the problems with inductive reasoning is that you have data, you have information. Um, and, and how you perceive that information, uh, it, it can be altered based upon confirmation bias, like what you are desiring to believe or your worldview behind that, right? You could read, uh, you have people, I mean, we can point this right back to one of the, you know, the black magics of, of Calvinism, right? You can have people who read John <laughs> Calvin and say, 
Well, according to Calvin's writings, he will, he believed in limited atonement. According to Calvin's writings, he believed in unlimited atonement, right? You have the same people are reading the same information, but they come to do two different conclusions, right? And I mean, mm-hmm. it's almost, I, I, I can't think of any instance where their confirmation bias isn't playing a part in that, right? People who believe in unlimited atonement say, well, John Calvin believes in unlimited atonement, right? You see, that's where confirmation bias, that's where choice plays a part in how we interpret the evidence and, and the, the conclusions that we draw from that and, we, and things that we choose to believe. It's funny. Uh, what you're talking about reminds me of, uh, I might as well pick on James White, or uh, <laughs> the debate between Pritchett Flowers, uh, Hernandez, and Zachariadis, the free will debate. Uh-huh. Um, they, they will take a verse and they'll say, you know, this is why God has total control over the, the uh, everything. <laughs> and uh, the other side, our, our side, or Pritchett or whoever will say, we have no problem with that verse. What what we have is a single verse that says something, and then your interpretation of it, my interpretation of it. What James White does is he he will get into the Greek and say, um, because the Greek uh, specifically can be taken this way, therefore it has to be taken this way. Right. And and what we would respond with is, just because it can be taken that way doesn't mean it has to be. There are other options. Right. And really, someone asked on the Facebook group recently about Ephesians one. Uh, 1 through 11. Mm-hmm. And you have in there language that sounds like God is picking individuals to be saved from the foundation of the earth. And then you also, and that same language can be understood to mean he chose a corporate group to save before the foundation of the earth. And it depends on what perspective you're choosing to take. And it is, it's a choice. You're, what you're choosing to, to, to bring to that, that is what's going to ultimately determine. I hate to use that word, but your choice is determining your interpretation. Right. That makes sense. Absolutely. Um, we, and, and that kind of goes back to the whole duck and the rabbit thing, right? Where it's the same yep. evidence, but it, it, we perceive it differently based upon um, persuasions, worldview. I mean, all sorts of different things. And that's what Dr. Flowers, I mean, that's his whole point of Sociology 101 is to show that you don't have to read this one passage this one way and i mean mm-hmm. we've seen that i mean how many times have we seen a passage completely and totally different than we had growing up right because we have other other pieces that show us that this can be taken i mean it's like the word dead right <laughs> you know dead doesn't yeah, necessarily yeah. mean literally dead with you know like a corpse right it also can point to separation it can point to um also it's a relational term yeah relational yeah. term right and and uh, the word um, we see that in, in various terms. We see that with election. We see that with adoption. Right? All these terms um, have different meanings. I mean, that language is very dynamic. Right? You can have literal meaning. You can have metaphors. You can have yeah, idioms, and all those things can. And but sometimes we get into a mindset of like, well, it has to mean this. Uh, we did this with the. Do- I mean, hell. Right? We we I used to read passages and say that passage can be taken no other way but to mean this. And then I studied the subject. I looked at like, mm-hmm. oh, well, if, if I think that that has to mean that, and that, that same passage and, and how it says forever and ever is used in the Old Testament, but we know that it's not, that, that city is still not burning today because otherwise it would be on the news. Like, why is it still, is this city still burning, yeah. right? Forever Giant and ever. smoking hole. Yeah. Right. I mean, so it, so if, if it doesn't mean it there, then why, why do we assume that it has to mean it here? I mean, that's, that's one of its confirmation bias. Um, one of its presuppositions, um, but it goes back to, I mean, science understands this. Science understands confirmation bias, and they try to do things to alleviate that, but they don't alleviate it. Um, they try to do things to, um, to to get to deductive reasoning, but most of their things are based on inductive reasoning with presuppositions and, and worldview behind those things. Um, they have a limited, a limited amount of data, and they're trying to draw conclusions from that data, and those are inductive conclusions. And then you have you know, people doing further research and, and, and theories based upon things that were already deduced by inductive reasoning that could be wrong. Uh, inductive reasoning is possible. It's possible that it could be true, but it's not guaranteed that it could be true. It's not deductive. Um, so we see that both in science, uh, because people always say, well, science is like, you know, all about fact and empirical evidence. No, it's not. <laughs> if that's your idea and understanding of what of what that is, then you need to study science more. Maybe, than maybe in an ideal sense, mm-hmm. it it could or should be right, but to assume that there is no bias at all in the system and that that there's no interpretation happening, it, it's all <laughs> right. Uh, 
we don't live in an ideal world. There right. is plenty of that. Yeah. Right. Right. So ultimately it goes back to, you know, who are you choosing to rely upon? You know, um, scientists are relying on the trustworthiness and information that other scientists are providing or other data that's being provided. And again, that data can be interpreted in various ways, depending on confirmation bias and conclusions. And, you know, do you have all the evidence, you know, uh, and, and religion is the same way, right? We have our own confirmation bias. We have our own way, our own worldview of how we look at information. Ultimately, it goes back to who are you choosing to believe in? Who are you choosing to trust? Who are you persuaded by? You used right. that word earlier, persuasion. Right. Uh, I want to remind people we have an episode on faith. And if you're a skeptic and you manage to listen to this episode, you may be thinking, well, Christians just are faith, and that's just blind. You don't have any. Actually, the biblical word that's translated faith, the Greek word, is pistis. And pistis means divine persuasion. Uh, it is, it is in fact, a, a persuasion. He has given us enough evidence that we can be persuaded of the fact that he is and that he rewards those who seek him, Hebrews 11.6. Mm-hmm. The the contrast to divine persuasion pistis what we are what we are supposed to believe and take hold of is human persuasion persuasion of of man uh paul actually points that out in in galatians he talks about how these people are the church in galatia is being misled and bewitched by these people who are trying to convince them to go do the stuff of the law that they don't have to do anymore or they think they that they never had to do in in some cases and he says uh is this persuasion from God. The, so you have in, in the minds of Paul and James, you have the idea of divine persuasion that leads you to God. Essentially, he gives you the truth and you can believe it and be faithful to it. Or you have persuasion from any other source that is not the truth and you can believe that and be faithful to that. Uh, it's two choices and that sounds should sound very familiar to our normal listeners uh, God has placed before us today life and death, blessings and curses. Follow the spirit, follow the flesh. You, you have really, at the end of the day, it's all about persuasion. Who are you persuaded to follow? Romans 1 says that God has made himself evident that people who don't trust him are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And what are they doing? They're trading in the truth, what he gave them, for lies, their own persuasion, persuasion of something else. Right. It's like Jeremiah seventeen five. Cursed is the man whose trust, uh, whose trust in, <laughs> cursed is the man whose trust in mankind and makes flesh his strength, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Right. You're you're trusting or being persuaded by something that is not the truth that God gave you, and so, uh, that that is setting your worldview. Like Billy said, that is setting your uh, your paradigm, and you're going to view the world and 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 interpret it, interpret the facts based on that outlook versus the truth and, and a different outlook, a different perspective on right. everything. Right. And I mean, we've mentioned it over and over with first John uh, five, right? The one who believes in the son of yep. God has a testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him being God a liar because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. Um, uh, the verse prior to that says, if we receive the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. So it, it's giving that like that, like, look, we can follow what men say, but God's testimony is greater. And I guess it goes mm-hmm. back to whole, the whole discredit thing. We can discredit men, right? You can men can can bear false witness, but God has shown over and over again that He's not a liar. That He does. Um, ha- you have reasons to believe Him. You have reasons to trust in what He says, right? And that's the, where the whole idea of faith comes in: is that your faith is isn't um, unwarranted belief or anything like that. It's it's putting your trust and allegiance into God, right? Based upon persuasion, divine evidence, divine conviction, um, things that you see in the physical world, things that you see uh, that you may have, intuitive knowledge that you may have. All of those things are part of the divine persuasion, the divine pistis. It's, I also think about the, I think they're at Mount Hermon, but Jesus is with the disciples. They're at what it's called the gates of hell. And he asks people or his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, good job. You figured it out. No, right. I'm sure says, glad some man, other man told you that. Yeah. I go, whew, man, I'm glad we're getting the news out. No, he says, uh, flesh did not reveal that to you. Yeah. Flesh the, and blood did not reveal that to you. God did. Right. That truth comes from God. 
Anybody who believes that truth, like Billy just read in First John 1, 5, if you're believing the testimony of someone else, that's because the testimony of God is already in you. The truth only comes from God. And really, it's it's only by revelation, right. <laughs> which is what it's saying. But yeah, any, anybody, anybody, anywhere in the world who says that God is the king and is the Lord is because they are persuaded by the witness that God put in them in the first place. Correct. Right. Yeah, we were talking about that on a drive yesterday that, you know, God, anybody who's believing in God is believing based upon his own witness. Like God basically can only witness of himself, right? Because he's outside of everything, right? He can only testify and provide witness of himself. We we can't do that. We can hear from his witness and then, you know, carry it along. But again, the originator of God's, of who God is, of that he exists, of his power, of his you know eternal attributes, the originator is all from God. Yeah, it's it it, it kind of uh, is hand in hand with the idea that truth is not something that we come up with. B- Billy and I didn't come up with the universal witness; we discovered it. It was revealed through Scripture that the universal witness is a thing. Um, so, it, it, how did we get it? Well, we got it from God. So when we pass it along to you, listeners. How are you getting it? Yeah, we're the mouthpiece, but really it comes from God still. He's the source of, of the truth. We're just noticing it. We're, we're, we're understanding it. But again, truth is not contrived. The only thing that's contrived are, fa- are, are um, lies. You take something that you see as the truth and you choose to believe something else. That is something you made up on your own. That is right. a lie. That is not from God. Right. That, that falls into what blasphemy is, you know, calling someone else saying what a claim that someone else said is not true, right? You're blaspheming what they said. Um, you yeah, there was something that you said there that I want to talk about and it just went poof. Poof. I was talking about, uh, truth being objective and not. Something oh we yeah. Dis- we, we talked we, about we this history it. too, right? And, and you know, we yeah. mentioned that God's truth, the God's witness of himself and who he is and his plan and all that stuff. You know, it, it, he's originator. And we, we've talked about this multiple times that, that's where we go. It goes back to, you know, it's the spirit that testifies, right? It's the spirit. It's always been the spirit, God, the spirit that has testified of God, right? Christ himself said that I speak through the power of the spirit, right? Even himself, right? Speaking through the power of the spirit, Old Testament saints, you know, or Old Testament um, unbelievers, right? Uh, Stefan says that, you know, you currently people in the living in the first century that are listening to my message are just like your ancestors, guys from like 2000 years ago, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. Right. So Mm -hmm. I'm speaking. God is providing witness and conviction of my speaking of it being true. You know, that is being persuaded that that conviction is in your heart. You know, it's true and you're resisting that truth. Right. You're choosing not to believe it just like the ancestors did or your ancestors did. Yeah, it comes down to what you choose to believe. So you have before we get into uh, the, the kind of line of questions that we talked about beforehand about the Bible and stuff like that. Um, let's back up to skeptic who rejects uh, Christianity versus Christianity. If you have a person like Matt Dillahunty, who has decided that he is not persuaded by the evidence God says he's given everybody, um, the evidence of scripture, historical evidence, whatever, uh, logical evidence of God, he is not persuaded by that then you necessarily have a person who has set their mind, um, well, like Romans 8 says, on the things of the flesh. Uh, that he, is, he is only persuaded by himself in what he thinks is right, and he is rejecting the truth. At that point, he is at least very consistent. He is a skeptic. He, he, is, he has to question everything because if anything comports with the truth, he has to reject it and find a way to justify that rejection. Um, and that's true of anybody. If, if you're going down that road and that's why Romans eight says what it says, if you are setting your mind on the flesh, you can't please God. Why? Because you are rejecting any truth that comes your way. If you're consistent about it. Um, that, and honestly, that's what, uh, who is it? Francis Schaefer. I think it was, he has this thing that he describes. I think it's called the line of depravity, but it's, it's over the course of history. If you're looking at a, at a society, you'll see a movement through certain, um, elements Uh, so it starts with i think he says it starts with uh philosophy and then art and then you see it move 
um, uh, this move away from God towards depravity through these different things um, at different points in history. And that's why you, you look at art and you have kind of uh, uh, it devolves from concrete, uh, beautiful images into uh, kind of cubism and, and this, these abstracts into completely abstract things that that don't make any sense when people look at it and go, mm, yeah, it's beautiful. Like, I don't, it's my kid could have made that. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not beautiful to me. Um, and this is a whole argument on beauty, but, um, if you're rejecting truth, concrete truth, then really anything goes at that point. You, you can, even your own morality becomes abstract and, uh, it, it becomes, well, what is right for Billy? It's very postmodern. What's right for Billy? That's right for Billy. What's not right for me? And I can go do what I want. And if I think that that uh, you know killing people is okay, well, that's right for me. You know, it's it, it, if you reject concrete truth, you're making up your own lies as you go along, and you'll be persuaded by uh, every wind of doctrine, as as the right. Bible says. It anything just... that you know you want to believe. Really, again, it goes back to decision and choice and desire. Um, you know, if if you've created for yourself a worldview in a measuring system um, that you know one of the things that in, that came up in the debate um, was Matt Dillahunty said you know God picked the worst time in the world to provide uh, to choose to resurrect his son right and that he should have done it today right <laughs> and then later so we on can have Right. All this scientific proof that it happened. Yeah. Right. So we can see it, cameras, all this stuff, right? Um, he could, you know, we could have put him in an electric chair and, you know, saw the data of him being dead and everything like that. And then later on, Mike Winger said, you know, well, if that happened, would you believe, right? <laughs> he's like, nope. well, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That's just, yeah. That's it's, just like the rich man in Lazarus. I right. we talked about that last week. Uh, I'll send you can't, just because I send them back. Send your brother someone who was raised from the dead doesn't mean they're going to believe. They're already rejecting the witness that's been given to them. Right. Yeah. All it's right. you know this maybe this is a mini topic. Help me remember this. Um, do are we responsible for or what to what extent are we responsible for contending for the faith with someone who is rejecting God. And maybe this goes into evidential versus presuppositional apologetics. And that's a bigger argument, <laughs> but, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it between episodes. Uh, right. I think that'd be, could be interesting. So again, it goes back to, um, justifiable, right? Matt Dillon, it, it again, falls back over and over again. He doesn't provide arguments of like why it can't be true. Only that it, he's skeptical and it's not the kind of evidence that he wants for it to be justifiable in his mind. It's not good enough. Right. Yeah. It's not good enough. But ultimately uh, what Mike did in that debate was use uh, historical evidence and in ways of measuring historical reliability to say that in fact it is reasonable. And, And again, without providing a solid argument for why it's impossible Mike technically won that debate. Um, Billy, how do you know the universal witness is true? <laughs> uh, well, I saw it in scripture. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> okay, take take the Bible away. Because if it's true, we don't need the Bible. How do you know the universal witness is true? Um, because I experience it. It's intuitive to me. Um, I watched a video yesterday of street epistemology which is the counter to street evangelism, for those of you who don't know. I just learned that yesterday. Street epistemology is where atheists go out and they, they talk to Christians and they talk about epistemology knowledge and, and show them that you know what you believe is based upon anything. right? It's not based upon evidence. It's based upon faith and, and all sorts of stuff. But anyway, um, it's intuitive, right? Um, it, it's intuitive. It's introspective. Um, I, I can see the world through deductive reasoning, through logical reasoning, um, uh, through uh, innate under, I mean, it to me, it's like innate understanding that I that God exists. I, I don't see how anyone can not believe that God exists. Um, you can use some so, of the philosophical arguments, you know, the Kalam 
right? You, you could look at rationality. You can look at, you know, uh, the Kalam uh, uh, moral argument, rationality arguments. You know, those are just philosophical arguments that you can, you know, through introspection and, and such that you can come to various conclusions. Um, t order of the universe, all those things just point intuitively to there's a creator, um, the, the the moral conscience that I have of knowing right and wrong of when I do something that is considered evil, uh, something inside me uh, compels me that, that what I'm doing is wrong and, and it and it is trying to persuade me to do what is right. <laughs> okay, so those are that's evidence for you. I mean, it's anecdotal for me. I don't right. I don't, I'm not feeling what you're feeling. Personal evidence. Um, how do you know that <clears throat> I got that same witness? Um. Through, well, I'm not, I'm not, uh, let's just assume I believe what you're saying and you have all of that. How do you know I have it? Because I can see a skeptic watching this video and saying, they're just assuming I got all that, but I don't think I did. Um, so how do you know everybody gets that? Well, besides the scripture, you mean? Like if I didn't have that? Can, can you know without without the Bible saying it, without revelation? Um, again, it goes back to um, understanding, um, I think, again, intuitive knowledge, introspective knowledge of understanding God's character, right? Um, and uh, a just God, a good God, would not um, would not give one and nothing. Well, I guess you'd have to – there's two ways to say that. If you didn't yeah. get it, then I would say that God wouldn't judge you and throw you in hell. <laughs> That's based upon my introspection and um, intuitive knowledge of God and his character. He would not throw you into hell. So I, I, I couldn't It'd be unfair. Right. I couldn't, um, you know, with absolute and certainly say everybody got it. But I but based upon my intuitive introspection, whatever you want to call it, um, understanding of God and his character. It's either you're not going to help because you didn't he didn't give it to you or you did get it. So. So beyond just intuition, which I'm not, I, you know, obviously I agree with you and what you're saying, but beyond intuition, uh, bringing the Bible back onto the table, mm -hmm. how do we know who he is and, and who he's witness to? Obviously the scripture, right? Right. Any other, any other physical evidences that we can appeal to? Physical, well, again, by our revelations that we can appeal to. That, that would be evidence for someone else. I could say this is a revelation. Personal revelation, uh, right. universal witness, is, is internal. Um, external special revelation. Is there anything external special revelation that we can appeal to besides scripture? Um, I don't know. I mean, you've got – because that, that's still alternate, you know, etern e internal, like conscience and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. It's – if there is something and it's something obvious I should know, I, I'm, my brain's dead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, an hour of talking about what we know is, is not easy, actually. <laughs> um, so uh, what, what I'm getting at is uh, we do depend on Scripture. Right. Um, and what about – how do we know Scripture is reliable? Through historical evidence, archaeological evidence. So when we talk about – receiving the truth from God and trusting that that is internal intuitive, but we are also not only depending on that because he also witnessed through other means that we are having to analyze and decide whether or not it's true. We would believe the Bible mm -hmm. based on its historical, uh, reliability. We believe the gospels based on their reliability. We believe Jesus because the gospels <laughs> told us about him. Um, internal, the universal witness does not, tell us the specifics of the gospel uh, of, of what Jesus did. It, that comes from the Bible. Right. Um, so w when we're talking about trusting the Lord and his witness, that is, uh, that does not exclude Christians from analyzing evidence, external evidence. Right. So external a lot of the, evidence. Yeah, yeah. A lot of things that I was mentioning are, are introspective, right? They're all kind of in the mind, you know, they're outside of the five senses, Right. It's all in your, your mind, right? I think, therefore, I am, right? That's all outside of my, like, you know, sight, touch, feel, you know. Sight. Kind of basic beliefs. Right, yeah. right. It's all in the mind, right? But we also have those observational or, uh, or the five senses, right? Things that we can touch, see, you know, all that stuff. We can see observational, right? I think, I personally believe that Romans 1 speaks of the observational, right? right? What you see, and then also that introspective, right? What God has, like, made known, it's evident within you, like what he's placed inside you. So I see the observational things that you can just look at like this, the, 
the order of the universe and look at various things like that. So things that you're observing and, and understand. Um, so it's like, you're, I think what you're trying to say is that we have multiple witnesses that are all coming together um, as, as a, as a cohesive unit where it shows that we have a reasonable belief. It's not just based upon one set of evidences, one types of evidences. We have, you know, scripture, we have personal testimony, um, historical documents, we have um, observational things, we have uh, personal experience, etc. Exactly. It, when we have, um, I guess, yeah, what I'm trying to describe is, is kind of a, uh, <laughs> a fully four-dimensional orbed diamond shaped. No, <laughs> <sorry>. uh, <laughs> um, what we have is a, a, for lack of better term, but a full bodied witness. It, it is not only intrinsic, but it's extrinsic. We are not only depending on a uh, personal uh, understanding, but we have uh, from top to bottom, we have the feeling that he is real, the logical evidence that he is real, the external evidence through Christ that he is real. Um, and, and, and taken as a whole, we are not just logical creatures. We are not robots. We have emotions. Mm -hmm. And for a, a truth to only be one or the other, that's a big problem. Uh, um, Mormons depend on the emotional side. Look, we want you to read this book, and we want you to feel the burning in your bosom that it's real. The problem is your book has all kinds of historical problems that don't comport with reality. <laughs> and, and so I can't depend on emotional, fizzy feelings only. I have to depend on logical understanding too. Right. On the other hand, if I look at if I look in the world and I say only science can be right, um, and well, you're you're deceiving yourself if you claim that you love anybody. <laughs> you are uh, science cannot explain. Uh, science works within the box of our universe, but you can't explain anything outside of that. It you you have to rely on some kind of uh, intuition or internal understanding to to uh, philosophical understanding to uh, go beyond what you can directly observe. It is not just enough to have uh, scientific evidences. You need more than that. Right. And what you get from Scripture, what you get from God, is you get truth implanted in you, and then you get evidences that he constantly will direct back to the truth. You are observing the fact that there is something rather than nothing. That's me. He draws a string to it. You are observing that um, there is uh, a a sense of morality that... It is global. There are mm -hmm. certain things that are objectively wrong. That's me. He pulls right. a string back to it. Yeah, and, you can and sense over that. Over. Lot like you can make rational decisions where a decision has meaning behind it and such. That's him, right? Logic, understanding, rationality. Yeah, it's both emotional and intuitive, and uh, deductive and external and and based on observation. Right. It is the full thing, not just one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people who reject um, religion and Christianity and such, um, again, and, and, and oftentimes they fall back on science. Um, and, and oftentimes I hear, you know, science is uh, science and empirical evidence, or they, they, they combine them tr trying to say that science is always empirical evidence, and it's, it's not the case. Um, I would, uh, every, I think all honest scientists. Definitely philosophers who have an understanding of science will all tell you that many, 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 many things that science comes up with is based on inductive reasoning, which means that it's it's probable, but it's not guaranteed, or it's, it's a possible outcome. I mean, that's why we see so many theories, scientific theories, right? And again, that's why they're called theories, not facts, right? We see so many scientific um, uh, claims that 20 years later, they completely and totally change. I mean, I think there's... I remember six different times that the reason for the dinosaurs extinction changed, you know, from a volcano to a ice age to uh, asteroids. I mean, meteorite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, and, and I will say again, that is not a failing of the scientific method, right? The scientific method's great, but that's all it is. It's a method. It's a right. way of observing, uh, making a, uh, an educated guess about something, testing it, analyzing the outcomes and drawing a conclusion. But again, mm -hmm. your conclusion, how you, understand the information that's coming out will be manipulated by your predisposition and, and the amount so, of data you have and all that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have, uh, there's a lot of room for error in uh, looking at science as this entire institution of using the scientific method, analyzing the results, distributing the results, 
uh, <laughs> fake news is a big thing these days. Mm-hmm. And uh, I see plenty of scientific articles that are just you know wrong. Garbage. And, and Yeah, it, because they, they can't trust the people who are distributing it. So um, I don't know where I was going with that, but... Uh, yeah, and you know this. This what pops in my head when we go through all this. But wow, there's just a lot of like, whom do I believe? Right? Whom am I going to serve? <laughs> right? Choose and, this day. Yeah. Right? Whom you're going to serve? Life or death? Blessing, curse? And and it, and it makes me again think of Pascal's wager. Right? Mm-hmm. What when you n- narrow it all down? You know, if if I am persuaded or choose to believe that God doesn't exist and I'm not going to serve Him. And try to honor him and walk in faithfulness to him. If I choose not to do that, and he's real, what's the, what's the, what am I, what am I going to lose at the end, right? Versus, right, yeah. right. Versus, what's the cost? You know, if I do believe in that and I live my life that way, what am I going to lose? What's the cost? Right? That, that wager. I will say, it, to an extent, trusting or saying you're a Christian because you know what do I have to lose? you know that uh, you're stepping the right direction but you got you know that's not true faithfulness you got to actually believe that he is and that he rewards those who seek him that's what that's what biblically he right that's that's to get you to make the decision right (laughs) right 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 right. yeah pascal's wager is not the end of the road yeah Uh, it's just like if like you know you live in a country you're like well there's all these there's like eight kings in this continent that i live on you know, I'm looking at, I'm wagering, okay, if I go to that one, I can. there's this. If I go to that one, there's this. If I choose not to believe, you know, you're making it t- to make the decision. You know, you still have to make the decision. Okay, well, I'm going to choose to follow that king. And that there's obviously the expectation that you're going to follow that king and do what he says and honor him and be allegiant to him. Cool. So at the end of the day, what we believe is real and true is that uh, what you believe is based on what you're persuaded by, what right. you're choosing to believe. We didn't even get into really uh, evidence being effectual and that it, it can cause you to believe. Well, we kind of did. Right. But um, evidence is not causal, even though a lot of people think yeah. it is. No, it's, it's the interpretation of that evidence. And really your interpretation is based on how you want to view that evidence. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and uh, at the end of the day, scripture says there's only one source of truth and that's God. And he's given that truth to everybody. And you can either take hold of that, you can you can be faithful to that truth, or you can trade that truth in for lies that you make up yourself, and you can go on your merry way. <laughs> and that's 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 the fundamental uh, choice that God has given everybody dominion over to to either choose Him or to choose the flesh and and do your own thing. Mm-hmm. And that will color your decisions and your understandings from there on out. Yep. All right. Uh, what else we got? Will you need to shout out anything? Um, let's see. I don't think so. Um, for all of you who are listening to us on the podcast, um, we encourage you to, even if you aren't going to watch us on YouTube, go subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we're making any money off of it. No, <laughs> it's just it's nice to see uh, the impact. Right. You know? The the more views you have, the the more it starts popping up in other people's um, feeds for um, you know somebody who types in Jesus or you know the witness of God, then it's going to start you know putting us more at the top of that list. So it's just help us manipulate the algorithms. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. what we want. <laughs> yeah. Um. Also, go subscribe to. Stereology 101, uh, Trinity Radio, and The Narrow Path. Does, does Steve Gregg have a YouTube channel? I know he has um, a He's got a guy. So he Steve doesn't do anything on his own. Basically, he's got loyal followers who do these things for him. Um, and there's oh. a guy who, anytime he has like a live feed, will put it on The Narrow Path website and things like that. Gotcha. Okay. So uh, it may not be a Narrow Path channel to subscribe to, but, you know, throw Steve some support. He's uh, fantastic. Uh, on the mini, there's no telling what we end up talking about. I'm not going to promise you anything. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. <clears throat> Whatever it is that, uh, that about it? persuaded to choose to believe in. Boom. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, until next time. God, God bless. bless.